Good day, I'm Chef Scott Samuel, and welcome to our live event today with Ruby. And we're gonna be working with Chef Jackie Pfeiffer and Chef Alyssa Waters from Chicago and the French Pastry School. And today is part three of a six part series uh, focusing on fillings, buttercreams and frostings. Uh, and we're kind of going in order with our cake decorating and baking arts course. That is our third course that we've launched with the French Pastry School. It's an approximately 70 hour course. And the, the first two of this series, we're talking more about equipment and getting set up in the kitchen. Uh, part two was all about sponges and how to make sponges. And now we're going into the next step, which is in line with what we're teaching on the course, frostings, buttercreams, and fillings. So we're gonna go through a variety of different of our recipes and show you key aspects of it. And then Chef Alyssa and Jackie will talk about some of the details, tips and techniques. Uh, and we'll go through, I think, six videos, and then we'll drop into Q&A and answer some of your questions. So if you haven't been to a live event before, on the top right of your page, there's a place to enter questions, and these will queue up along with all the questions that are here. And if you like some of the questions, you can heart it, and it will kind of bring it to the top so we can address it. Hopefully you enjoy this event. I'd like to introduce Chef Jackie and Chef Alyssa. Um, welcome to part three. Thank you. Thank you. Very happy to be here and to uh, to discuss some different topics about uh, the cake uh, decorating course. All right. So first of all, Chef Jackie, tell us a little bit about your short career. I know you've been doing this for a few years. <laughs> I've been doing this for a long, long time uh, uh, when dinosaurs were still around, right? But uh, <clears throat> uh, been baking for uh, a few a few years now, and uh, and uh, we um, we have a school here in Chicago that uh, it's been operating for 26 years, and uh, and uh, we uh, did this wonderful partnership with Ruby where we could translate our uh, brick and mortar education into online courses, and we started with a pastry course. Uh, then followed by a bread course, and now uh, the trilogy is complete with a cake decorating course. And uh, Chef Alisa here uh, used to be, um, is still our uh, instructor, cake decorator and instructor, and uh, that's why we brought her in because she's um, she's uh, making cakes every single day, right? Yeah, pretty much. So if you want to go to the first topic, uh, Chef Scott. So the first topic, we're going to go into a bittersweet dark chocolate uh, ganache filling. So this is one of the few fillings that are represented in the course. And uh, what is ganache, Chef? Tell me some of the pointers that you can uh, share with the, the students around ganache. What is ganache? Uh, ganache is uh, uh, chocolate of uh, high quality. Uh, we use uh, guitar chocolate. And uh, the ganache can be made with uh, dark chocolate, milk chocolate, or white chocolate. And um, it's uh, mixed with uh, heavy cream. You, you boil the heavy cream and you pour it over the semi-melted chocolate. And, and then you mix it to create an emulsion. And at the very end, we add a little bit of soft butter just to make it even uh, richer, but also smoother. And uh, so you can make a simple ganache, uh, white milk or dark chocolate, or you can also infuse the heavy cream. And uh, what are things we could use to, to uh, infuse this cream, Chef um, Alisa? Teas are good. Um, I love Earl Grey and dark chocolate. Um, coffee, uh, spices are really nice yes. um, to infuse. So lots of different um, options to kind of create your own flavor profile with ganache. Yeah, and you can also put uh, citrus zest in the heavy cream, uh, vanilla beans. Uh, the, the beauty with, with heavy cream, it contains 60% uh, water, and that water is going to absorb that flavor and retain it. So it's always, uh, most of the time, we, we use the heavy cream uh, to infuse the ganache. Uh, a ganache can also be flavored differently. You could add, let's say, peanut butter to the to the mixture uh, that works well, uh, and maybe in that case you'll you won't put the butter. Uh, that's just one example, but um, usually the heavy cream is is what 
what is used to infuse that ganache. So I know you have a video, Chef Scott, to show us, right? Yeah, let's roll that video and then we can uh, go into a little bit more detail. Okay. Excellent. That last visual of the perfect ganache was awesome. You know, years ago when I was running an operation and doing desserts, I got really creative with my infusion process. First of all, I know that when we boil the cream, we just need to bring it straight to a boil and a scald and not reduce it all because we don't want to lose any of that moisture, the water, correct? Correct. Uh, I mean, if you if you look at the ingredients, we, we have a heavy cream, which has 35% fat. We have uh, chocolate, which has around 35% fat as well. And then we have butter, which is 82% fat. So it's pretty much fat plus fat <laughs> plus fat. <laughs> and the only water, usually the only water comes from the heavy cream. So that's a, a common mistake that people do. They just, instead of bringing the heavy cream to just a boil, they boil it for two, three minutes and and then they pour it in the chocolate and emulsify it. And, and what, what will happen often is the ganache will split. That means the fat is now, uh, uh, the percentage of fat is even higher since we evaporated more water and it will separate from the water. So, so that's, a, that's a problem that needs to be fixed. Uh, another problem is to to not use ingredients at at room temperature. For instance, you 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 make your ganache, you you pour the hot cream over the chocolate, everything goes well, and then you take a butter that just just came out of the refrigerator that is stone cold, and you put it in there uh, at the end, like uh, like you're supposed to, and the ganache is seizing up. Of course, it's seizing up because uh, all this fat got cold. It crystallizes and again it separates from uh, the rest of the ingredients. So following the temperatures of the the recommended temperatures for our ingredients is crucial. Uh, what else do we need to be careful of? Um, well, it's when you're talking about room temperature, it's important to make sure that your chocolate is melted appropriately. So having chocolate that could be very cold. Um, that can be a factor where it won't melt completely when you add your warm cream. Um, so that can be tricky or adding your butter, even though it's room temperature, when the ganache is too warm. Yes. So you have to wait for that ganache to cool down to about 38 degrees Celsius in order to add your butter. If you don't, the butter is just going to melt and you're not going to get that nice um, creaminess that we are looking for when we add the butter. Yes, absolutely. If you add your butter, if your butter is too soft or you add it too soon and, and the butter, instead of bringing this creamy factor to the ganache, ganache is now going to melt because of the temperature. It, it, it's too hot. Now you have a greasy ganache <clears throat> and you're like, oh, I don't like, I didn't care for this ganache. It was kind of like fatty. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, it's, it's the same amount of fat. It's just the way, the way you made the ganache. Okay. But, uh, you know, ganaches are, 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 uh, are used often for uh, by cake decorators because it's a very stable filling. And, uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about this during the entire event is, is in cake decorating, you cannot have fillings that are too light because imagine if you have a five or seven tier cake and you have this really fragile chocolate mousse, that cake, it will have a hard time standing up uh, during the whole uh, the whole wedding, so so we like uh, we like ganaches because they are firm. Uh, and talking about buttercream, you can also when, after making a ganache, you can mix it with uh, buttercream. So you know, uh, immediately you have a chocolate buttercream. So 
So that's, that's also an easy way to, uh, to create a second flavor. Um, did we cover Excellent. everything? Um, I just wanted to quickly cover steeping the cream um, when you have ganache. So yes. if you have like 100 grams of cream and you're steeping it with tea, you warm up the cream, you steep it for five minutes, and then you should strain out your tea and then rescale to, to the, the amount of cream needed on the recipe. Yes. Because that will also, the, the tea or any, any sort of herb or spice may absorb some of the heavy cream and that can also throw off your your recipe. Yeah. And I want to say one last thing, uh, Chef Scott, is that <clears throat> ganaches are sometimes used uh, to uh, uh, frost the cake, uh, like they pour it over over a cake like a glaze. But um, since this this ganaches are so high in fat, eventually once you refrigerate this cake, that fat is going to crystallize. It's going to look kind of like whitish. So, and also in time, we're talking about after 24 hours, it's going to start to crack. So that's why later on in the, in the event today, we're going to talk about a chocolate glaze, which is something we pour over cakes and that will protect the cake and make it look super shiny uh, without any problems. Okay, perfect. Yeah, um, love ganache. I used to make it and make uh, truffles out of it. So I'd make it and then yes. it kind of make uh, truffles we need uh, spicy uh, chili truffles with the ganache yes. all right so let's move into the the wonderful buttercream and the three types of buttercreams and what is buttercream and what are the differences between french italian and swiss and then we'll go into a video and see the french one first okay i can start with the french so because i'm french so only the french can make french buttercreams chef scott uh no, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, French buttercream is pretty much um, uh, a mix of something that we call a pâte à bombe. That's your French lesson for today, Chef Scott. Uh, it's, uh, we create a syrup with sugar and water, and then we, we cook it, and then we pour it over the eggs as the eggs are being whipped. And what this will do is the heat of the... Um, of the syrup is going to pasteurize the um, the eggs and is also going to semi-coagulate them and make make that form that egg form uh, pretty stable. Okay, that's what we call a patabon. And then once and then we whip it until it's cold, so it kind of look, looks like spongy. And then we fold in the butter that has been previously whipped until it's very light. And, uh, and that's French buttercream for you. And after that, you flavor it whichever way you want to. You want to tackle uh, Italian uh, buttercream since you're half Italian? I'm not half Italian, but I would be happy. Oh, oh yeah, Italian go ahead, Chef. Let's check out the, the French buttercream video and uh, okay, take no a problem. look at what you just explained for technique. Interesting. So that video was the, the very end of flavoring the butter for the buttercream, correct? Yes, absolutely. 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 So, so the, the, the French uh, buttercream is, uh, uh, it's very tasty, uh, but it's usually used as a filling and not so much as a frosting because it's not completely white and people like a cake that is very white right? Because you're Usually. supposed to be pure, right? Mm -hmm. If so, it's a wedding cake. Right. Yes. If it's a celebration cake, it can be any color, right? right. But, uh, but also, you know, it, since it's made with eggs and sometimes people like to keep their cakes in the, in the sun for some reason, we don't know why, but uh, that's what uh, happens sometimes. Uh, um, it's, it's, better, it's better to use it as a filling and to, to keep it nice and chill, okay? Anything else on French uh, buttercream? No. Go ahead, Chef Scott. Yeah, let's talk about Italian buttercream and uh, how it's made, the difference, and uh, the best use for it. 
so Italian buttercream is made with um, similar in the procedure to making um, the French buttercream. So you have a syrup, but in this case, we're not using whole eggs. We're just using the egg whites. So we're cooking the syrup and then we're uh, pouring the hot syrup over the egg whites and whipping to get a nice stiff peak meringue. And then we're folding in the butter that's already been previously whipped to, uh, to make a nice creamy um, frosting. Um, so Italian buttercream is, um, should be used, can be used for pretty much, it's like a, a universal buttercream to use. You can use it for a filling, you can use it for frosting. It's great for buttercream flowers, um, any sort of buttercream piping. Um, so there's not really anything um, it can't do. Yep. Excellent. So are we showing the video, uh, Chef Scott, or, or do you want to jump to yes. uh, Swiss buttercream? Let's go right into the video for Italian so we get a visual on that. Okay, no problem. <laughs> okay. All right, Swiss buttercream. Is this uh, one of those cream buttercreams that only the Swiss can make, or what makes this? Uh, yes, absolutely. Swiss buttercream? Only the Swiss can make make it. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, all kidding aside, it's it's kind of like uh, uh, the Italian buttercream, but this this time the eggs are mixed with the sugar. The egg white, sorry, the egg white are mixed with the sugar. And we whip it over a double boiler uh, to achieve the same uh, <clears throat> the same uh, uh, thing. We we heating up the egg white. It gets it gets semi-coagulated, gets pasteurized. The difference between the Italian uh, buttercream and uh, Swiss buttercream. The Italian buttercream is made with the syrup, so you'll have more water in the Italian compared to the Swiss because. With the Swiss, you go straight egg white and sugar and you whip it, okay? And after the whipping, uh, uh, then you whip it hot. And then after that, you whip it cold in the mixer. And once you get the beautiful meringue, then you fold in the soft butter, okay? Uh, same same thing, the, the Swiss uh, but, uh, buttercream can be used for pretty much anything, but... Uh, 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 people who do sculpted cakes, they like to use it very much, right? Yeah, it's it's what I primarily use um, for my cakes. It's just more convenient. It's faster, foolproof usually, so you don't have to worry. I know some people get a little bit nervous about syrups sometimes. I'm nervous. Um, I heard that about you. Get so um, Swiss meringue is a little bit more user friendly. Um, and it can be universally used for fillings, frostings, and for flowers, uh, buttercream piping. Um, so it, it's a good go-to recipe to use. So, so I want to talk about uh, temperature. Again, we, uh, we keep on talking about temperature. Uh, first of all, the butter that you're using has to be at room temperature. And when you take it out from the refrigerator, it takes forever to be at room temperature, right? Even if you let this sit out for two, three hours, it, it actually stays cold for a long time. So sometimes you have to warm up this butter a little bit and then whip it in the mixer, yeah? Until it really reaches uh, room temperature. And, and when this butter is super soft, it will mix very nicely with the patabon, the meringue, whatnot, right? Those two textures have to be very close to each other in order to fuse together, okay? If this is hard like a rock or it's just very stiff, it's not going to mix well. And then what happens is you're going to over mix it and deflate the egg white, the meringue, and then you have a, a buttercream that is- uh, It's just sweet butter. It's, it's just very buttery, very, very fat. Then the second thing is you need to make sure that you, you warm up your, syrups in the French uh, French buttercream, Italian buttercream, and Swiss with, with a good thermometer. That's very, very important because uh, remember for, the, for the, the Italian, for all of those, you 
relying on the heat to pasteurize the eggs. And, and, and if you don't have a good thermometer, you might not heat up your eggs enough and your, your eggs not only will not be semi-coagulated, they will not be hot enough. So I brought a, a couple um, a couple toys. I, I got them out of um, my toolbox. This is uh, called Thermapen. It's a very good uh, thermometer that uh, Thermoworks is um, is making. Uh, it reads in less than one second and 0.5 degree uh, accuracy. It's wonderful. And this one is this one fits very nice in your little pocket right here. Yeah, the Thermopop. Also very nice. So those are those are things that are very important. And of course, we have the chef alarm, which has this probe. This this goes very well when you need to uh, do the the Swiss meringue. You can hold this and then whip at the same time. Yeah. Um, can I just say? Yes, go ahead. When you're using uh, when you're making uh, Italian buttercream and Swiss buttercream, you have to use fresh egg whites. You cannot use the pasteurized egg whites. It won't whip up as nice and you won't get as much volume um, just because the way they treat the pasteurized egg whites, um, it just, it won't make a nice stable meringue. So um, fresh egg whites are key for those two buttercreams. Yes, yes, I agree. And uh, I mean, this is not the topic of the day, but uh, flavoring uh, buttercream is uh, also covered in the, in the course. Uh, where uh, sometimes we add fruit powder to uh, a buttercream, and you're gonna you're gonna say, why don't we add fresh fruit, right? Yeah. Why not? So um, fresh fruit usually, well, not usually. It has water. So if you wanted to make a um, strawberry buttercream and you're using fresh strawberries, there's a ton of water in strawberries. So once you start cutting it, it's going to release. Um, so we all know what happens when fat and water combine, they just separate and they don't create, they're not, unless you're making an emulsion, they, they don't create one on their own. So, um, and this has happened from experience a long time ago. If you, if you layer fresh fruit onto buttercream or you try to mix it in, that water just finds its way out. Yes. It's, especially when you put that cake in the fridge, the butter gets cold, the water starts seeping out, and then you can start getting little pockets of, of strawberry juice coming out of your cake. Um, so it's really important when you're uh, flavoring your buttercreams to use fillings that don't contain a lot of water. Um, so yeah. that's why we use the fresh fruit. So we like, we like to use fruit powder, which is just dehydrated, dehydrated fruit. Uh, uh, and so there's no water added to it. So a little bit goes a long way and there's no water. I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, Fresh strawberry, for instance, has 86% water. So uh, adding a, a strawberry juice to a buttercream is just asking for trouble. You're just going to weaken this uh, this uh, buttercream or and, break it. and or break it because too much water now will interfere with the fat. And then uh, you can also flavor your buttercreams with uh, coffee extract or uh, uh, even nut butters. Roasted nut butters goes really well with it. Uh, but there's many different different options to uh, to flavor a buttercream. If you use fruit compound, you got to be careful. You got to really taste it because some are good, some are not so good. So always follow your taste buds uh, uh, before you just add a bunch of raspberry compound that um, does not taste like fresh raspberry. Okay. Uh. Make note that this uh, cake bacon and decorating program has all of these recipes in its entirety in addition to the video. Yep. So let's take a look at the Swiss buttercream video for technique. Okay.
All right. So in the beginning of the video, uh, when I see we're putting the egg whites and the sugar in a bowl before we put on the double boiler, there was a, a little bit of a white powder added. Is that salt or is that an emulsifier? Or I know that's in the recipe, but I don't recall that addition. It's a cream of tartar. So that cream acid helps um, the egg whites kind of uh, coagulate and make a stronger yeah. meringue. But you could add salt too if, if you don't, if you cannot find cream of tartar, you know. Awesome. Well, thanks for the, the buttercream chat. Let's move into uh, frostings. And uh, one of the first ones we talk about in the program is the cream cheese frosting. Um, and I know that we're talking a lot about temperature and technique and emulsification and coagulation. Tell us the, the main techniques that we're going to learn with the cream cheese frosting. Chef Alisa, cream cheese frosting, cheese frosting. Your, your favorite uh cream cheese frosting is is different than the buttercreams where it's not made with a meringue base it's just made with um softened butter softened cream cheese and uh powdered sugar um, sometimes also known as um 10x you want to make sure you get a nice high quality uh, powdered sugar um and you want to make sure that you sift it uh really well and those three um, ingredients are beaten together. Um, if you don't sift your powdered sugar, you can end up with chunks of the powdered sugar later. And that, that will actually, they'll eventually dissolve, but it'll start to make a syrup um, and it'll kind of get watery um, in the cream cheese if it's not fully incorporated. Yeah, and the cream cheese, uh, a very, very common mistake is that it's just not, again, it's not at room temperature. Yeah. And one should never hesitate to uh, pop it in the microwave a little bit just to teach it a lesson. Five seconds. Uh, five seconds goes a long way. <clears throat> and uh, it will incorporate much, much better. It's just like making a cheesecake. It will incorporate much, much better with the, um, the butter and also uh, the sugar. And you were talking about a 10x um, sugar, uh, uh, powder sugar. It's just regular sugar that that a manufacturer is grinding and the finer, finer the crystals, the higher the X, right? You can find sugar that is six X or eight X or 10 X. And then, and I think you can even find 12, right? It's Me hard, but yeah. yeah. But here the most common you find is 10 X, which is a very fine uh, confectioner sugar, which is what we use here. It's, it, it dissolves very, very nicely. Uh, again, if you use a 6X sugar, you will find, you will actually see granulated sugar. You'll feel it <laughs> yes. in your mouth. Adds a little it. texture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A little crunch. <laughs> that you don't want. All right. So oh, you want to show us um, a video, Chef Scott? Yeah. Let's uh, do the cream cheese frosting video. Patrick. Okay. You tell me if we need to jump. All right. Huh? Excellent. So cream cheese frosting. I like what you noted about the powdered sugar on sifting. I've made uh, carrot cake a number of times, and one time I didn't have a sifter. And I just figured, oh, I'm going to beat it till it dissolves. And after the fact, and <laughs> yes. I frosted the cake, I had these little bubbles of uh, you know syrup, <laughs> liquid sugar. And I, my mm -hmm. friend said, how did you do that? I was like, that's a trick. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> but I realized yeah, after the fact, that must be it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if that right. does happen, so, and you do have, if you do have that syrup, you because there's no egg, mer, egg white meringue in there. You can, as long as it's room temperature, put it back on the mixer, and repaddle it, and that should fully incorporate the syrup if yes. you need to. Yes. And Excellent. and uh, so let's the move frosting on. is mainly used for. Um, we call it frosting, but in, in cake decorating, we use it as a filling, right? Mm -hmm. Not too of often course. as a frosting. I don't like to use it as a frosting. It's not as stable as the Italian. So if it's a single tiered cake, like it's just one cake, um, especially if it's like a carrot or a red velvet, I would uh, use it, um, but otherwise I don't use it. 
I only use it as a filling if it's for a stacked cake. Okay. All right. So moving on to uh, the last video, and we're going to talk about the dark chocolate glaze. So you notice uh, yes. you talked about this after the ganache. Uh, something the ganache would be a filling, and you could use the ganache as a frosting. But if you were to refrigerate it, you're going to get the uh, the sugar to bloom and crystallize. The dark chocolate glaze. This is where it comes in. You could use this for truffles for covering a cake. Uh, what else? Uh, small cake, individual cakes, large cakes. Uh, you can use it pretty much for uh, for anything. And <clears throat> the beauty with this is that uh, you can make it with dark white or milk chocolate. And um, the white chocolate glaze, you can then color it uh, with water-based food coloring. So the sky is the limit. And like I mentioned before, those glazes are very shiny. And also they're gonna they're gonna create a protective layer that will will prevent your cake from drying out. Okay, that's what that's very important. Could, the glazes can also be put onto cold buttercream cakes if they wanted to do like that classic drip that we see a lot. Um, the glaze can also be used for that, which is really nice because then once it's refrigerated, it won't crack either, because um, that can happen if you're just using a ganache. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, let's take a look at the video for uh, a nice visual. Okay. Excellent. So very simple, hot cream poured over chocolate. Uh, Whist, can you also, um, or would you ever infuse the cream with any flavor? Or are you going to just think this is such a thin layer, you don't want to mess with the proportions? I think we lost cut. Can you hear me? Patrick, can you hear me? No, we cannot. Yes, uh, we can talk about the, what. Yeah, we can we can go straight to questions. Um, uh, is uh, can you make this uh, closer a little bit, uh, Jeff, so I, so we can read the question? There you go. Okay. Is Yes, we can hear you now, Scott. All right, so the dark chocolate glaze, my question was, would you ever choose to infuse the cream because it's basically the hot cream poured over the chocolate or would you just keep it uh, all natural? The what, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, would you ever choose to infuse the cream for the dark chocolate glaze infuse like what? you would for the ganache? The cream. I didn't hear the question. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Let's go to the Q and A. Can we do that, Patrick? Okay. So uh, I'm going to read the first question. Is there a way to tone down the butter flavor of a buttercream? Sometimes it tastes uh, like eating a stick of butter. Right. So usually. Um, buttercream has a lot of butter in it, so it will have a butter flavor. If it's made correctly, it shouldn't taste very buttery or like a stick of butter. If it does, it's usually because the meringue has been deflated, and that's why you taste a strong butter taste. So um, if you carefully make it, you want to make sure you don't deflate the meringue. Um, you should also be flavoring it, so the buttercream is a base, so you should you know, add vanilla or other like coffee extract or an almond extract. Um, I also like to add a little bit of lemon juice, um, maybe about five grams for the recipe that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and that also like cuts out the um, the fat just a little bit, yeah. which makes it nice. Yeah, a little, little vanilla extract, little, little uh, zest uh, goes a long way. 
but also using the making the buttercream the the proper way will not will prevent it from uh, having a greasy feel okay uh we're gonna go to the next question room temperature can sometimes vary widely what is your definition definition of room temperature which is a very good question i would say around 68 what do you say no warmer warmer yeah i would say about 75 well but i like to do this i have a, like it's very technical technical so you take your spatula and you smush the butter so if you have a rubber spatula and it can easily go through your butter and you can easily spread it just with a rubber spatula you are in business to make yes. buttercreams cakes even uh to incorporate that butter into your ganache Yes. If um, if it's not, if, if you have some resistance, then you should be warming it up in the microwave five seconds at a time. Yes. Um, same with the eggs. I say like 70, at least 72. So, yes. So the, the reason why I answered 68 is because uh, I answered more like in the mindset of a pastry, pastry chef. chef. Yeah. And Chef Alisa answered more like in, in the spirit of a cake decorator where they, they, they need the, the room to be a little warmer so the the buttercream does not seize up so that's pretty much your answer right there between 68 and 72 right yep. that should that should be um, a nice uh, a nice temperature to work in you just okay? know your know your kitchen you know so if your kitchen's cold then you know you have to maybe warm it over a little water bath or in the microwave just to bring it to the right temperature yes Okay, then we have the next question. Is there a, a specific preferred use for each type of buttercream? For instance, decoration, filling, smoothness, etc. That comes from Florentino. Uh, we kind of already discussed it, but we can review one more time. Yeah. The French buttercream is primarily used for fillings. Um, you can also incorporate like different um, nut paste into the French buttercream or extracts as well. Um, Italian, and it's going to have a richer taste. So when you ask, like, well, why would I use it um, when I can use Italian? It has a very nice, rich flavor, more of a custard type background because of you have you have the eggs in there. Um, and then Italian and Swiss um, are primarily used for frosting, and they can also be used as filling. Yes. So uh, the the questions jumped a little bit, but uh, I saw a question that a person asked. Is he back? Yeah, I'm back. The internet Chef got Scott, there. are you so, back? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Uh, if you want to read the question about uh, browning the butter. Yeah, I see that somebody uh, hearted that up to okay. the top. Is it okay Go to ahead. brown part of the butter that goes into the buttercream and still maintain the structure? That's an excellent question because you're going to lose some of the, the moisture in the water. Uh, you can, I would say, start with maybe doing just a quarter of the butter, not all of it. Um, and you're going to have to obviously, once you brown it, let it chill um, so that you're not adding hot yes. brown butter. Um, but yeah, for to make a brown butter frosting, absolutely. But so, don't do all of the butter. Yeah. But have you, have you seen this done? Have you done it? Have you tried it? No, I've done it like with cookies, but I haven't done it with a okay. frosting. So that's why that's why I'm asking asking you because if we ask ourselves as chefs, have you ever seen this? Have you ever done this? And if both of us say no, typically, typically it's because it's it's not a good idea. I I know chefs, some chefs are browning parts of the butter to make croissants, and that's different because uh that the, the nuttiness goes really well with the, the mm -hmm. flavor of baked croissants, but browning browning the butter for a buttercream, technically, of course, it can be done. Like Chef Alisa says, maybe start with 25% of the butter and see where it, where it takes you. But at the end of the day, is it going to taste better? If it does, go for it. Uh, if it does not, then the answer is right there. Okay? And you have to remember, it's also going to add it. color to your buttercream. Yes. So it will. You may get the flex from the the caramelized milk solids, as well as um, just kind of an overall less white of a color. Yes. Chef Scott, like next a, question. A tasty buttercream. 
Yeah. Next yeah. question. Uh, this is a hard. This is a hard one for one of you. What can replace butter for vegans? Sure. Sure. Uh, you you just have to find the right the right uh, butter that goes for you. There's lots of vegan butters out there. Uh, I have never made. Have you made um, um, buttercream with uh, coconut uh, oil? No. Um, I've used like a vegan butter, um, but you have to make sure it's lower in salt because um, that's kind of the main thing that I look for. And yes. um, high fat. High fat content. High fat. Uh, we use uh, we use uh, European style butter from Plugra, which has eighty two percent fat. So whatever uh, uh, fat you're using, vegan fat, you, it technically should work. But you you gotta you gotta be close to the eighty two percent fat uh, that we that we need. Otherwise, if you have a, a vegan butter that is more like a spread, that it won't be, uh, it, it won't, it won't be stable enough, and then uh, it is gonna like fall off the side yeah, of the cake and, and and so on. So uh, try to find something that, that mimics butter and then yes, you should be able to do it. Okay, thanks uh, for the answer. Next question is coming from uh, Helena. I've been freezing egg whites for making the sponges. Can these egg whites once thawed be used effectively to make buttercream? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we do that all the time when uh, we have classes in session here. We always end up with extra egg whites and they always get frozen. Yes. And then we pull them out when we need them. Um, yeah. yeah. So as long as they were fresh going in, they're fine coming out. And and uh, actually, this question was asked uh, Chef Scott in our Q&A. Uh, as you know, we have uh, an intensive Q&A uh, rubric in, in each program. <clears throat> where students ask great questions. And a student was asking that question, can you freeze egg white? But also, can you freeze egg yolk? And and if you want to freeze egg yolk, you need to add 10% of sugar to it, and you mix it a little bit. And the sugar in contact with the, the water in the egg yolk is going to create kind of like a syrup, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to prevent the egg white to turn greedy, grainy, Green. when they... When they um, the frost, okay. So a little bit, a little bit of sugar, ten percent in the egg yolk, and then you can freeze egg yolk if you have extra egg yolk. Okay, excellent. Sounds like a practice that I'm always doing when I'm making ice cream and saving the egg whites for making the meringues. Yep. Yep. So here's a question that I think we answered a little bit about room temperature, and this is from Terry. Uh, please answer why room temperature is so crucial to success in the kitchen. Uh, I get an urge to bake for a gathering that happens with not much lead time, and I struggle to wait out the room temperature ingredients. So I think, Chef, you answered this about not waiting it out, but doing some quick microwave bursts until you get that perfectly smooth 72 degree soft butter and such, correct? Yes. Um, I mean, when when I get the urge of baking yeah. on the weekend because, I, you know, what else am I going to do? Uh, I decide to bake and then the, everything is too cold, yeah. so the butter... I pop it in the microwave and sometimes a 50% uh, power, um, half power on the microwave. But the eggs, for instance, I just I just take a bowl of hot water mm -hmm. and then I put another bowl with the eggs in there and I just whisk it a little bit. So uh, we're not cooking the eggs, we're just bringing it to room temperature, right. okay? And the, the, the reason why those ingredients have to be at room temperature is because they fuse together uh, when they are at the same temperature. Uh, a lot of those ingredients contain fat. And if one of this fat is stone cold and all the others are at room temperature, this one is going to make all the other fats crystallize and separate from the water in the mm -hmm. pound cake, let's say, and you'll have a broken emulsion in your pound cake. And it's going to It'll still bake, but still it'll bake. be greasy. Yes, it'll be greasy it and it, right it won't time. taste the same. Okay. Excellent. So, technique, um, temperature, all important to make these uh, buttercreams and frostings work out right. Yes. All right. Second, uh, next question is from Kate. Uh, can you please tell us about the level of sweetness or sweeten in your buttercream recipes compared to the usual ones you utilize in American style cakes? Is there a difference between the three recipes in terms of their sweetness? 
Yes, I actually it's a good question. I have not calculated um, the the sugar content of of the buttercream in our course. It's a good question, but we're gonna be in the range of uh, uh, you know eighteen percent. I want to say not super sweet. Uh, American buttercream is just butter and sugar. Do you have in your head a recipe? Yeah, it's usually like almost equal portions. So I think in an Italian meringue, like a very typical one, it's like one part egg white, two parts sugar. Okay. And then that meringue and is how, like- how many parts of butter? Um, like you take that meringue and then it's two parts of butter. So that's five parts, two parts. And so that's in American four. style, mm -hmm. it's e almost equal parts, sometimes even more um, powdered sugar to butter. Um, and that's because especially if it's a warmer climate, sometimes you just need to add more powdered sugar to make it more stable. Wow. So there's a there's a place for it because, you know, our palates in America are some of them are more suited towards a sweeter buttercream. I've had clients ask me specifically for a sweeter buttercream because um, they're not used to eating an Italian meringue or Swiss meringue. Um, so sometimes I'll do, actually we'll combine them. I'll combine an American frosting and an Italian rain frosting. So it's a little bit sweeter, but it's not that full on like sugar fest. Yes. So uh, the, the danger with this is that there's two ingredients mm. that cover up flavors. The first one is fat, too much fat in a, in, in a dish. It could be a savory dish, could be any kind of baked dish it will cover up the flavor if it's too fatty, if it's too high in fat. And the second one is sugar. Too much sugar in any kind of cake or any kind of mixture will cover up the actual flavor. Let's say vanilla is your flavor. It won't, you won't be able to taste the vanilla because it will, will be covered with fat the and sugar. The flavor is just sweet. Yes. <laughs> so that's the danger. Okay, I, I hear the convenience. Sometimes people uh, want a stable buttercream and this and that, but too much sugar, too much fat uh, will, uh, will uh, uh, cover up the flavor. That's why the French, uh, Italian, and Swiss buttercream, they all have a whipped com component that makes it lighter mm -hmm. and, and actually less sweet at the same time. The American frosting will actually, it'll actually form a crust as well. So like, because um, you have that powdered sugar, it, what happens is it'll start to dry out. So if you cover your cake and then you put it in the refrigerator, it starts to get kind of a thin crust on top of it, which isn't always pleasing. Um, so when you have Italian meringue or Swiss meringue, even French meringue buttercreams, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, thanks for the question, Kate, and thanks for uh, being part of our courses. Um, Olivia, um, we have this question, how long will each um, type of buttercream last in the refrigerator or the freezer? So we haven't talked about freezing these, and is that even recommended? In the freezer, in the freezer until the end of time, uh, you, can, you can keep things in the freezer until the end of time, but we all know that after one month, yeah. it tastes like the freezer. The freezer. <laughs> and so that's why in all our recipes, we say freeze for up to one month. You could leave it in the freezer for 10 years and it's still frozen, but it, would, it will taste like the Thanksgiving dinner that you have in there also, mm -hmm. and the lobster and the- and the, Lobster in the freezer. I have lobster in the freezer. So, so if the, that covers the freezing, <clears throat> the refrigeration, uh, a, a French buttercream, uh, it, it should be in our recipe. It's three to four days in the refrigerator. The Italian and Swiss is more like five days. Yeah, okay. I, I say five to seven. If you're using very fresh butter and very fresh egg whites. Yes. It's key. Okay. Um, here's a question from uh, Helena again. How do you make buttercream white? Mine seems to be yellowish. So we talked about the uh, the Italian one being the whitest with the, the white the egg whites and the sugar, but you know, based on the fact that you are adding some butter, like yellow right. to it, is there some other way to make it really white? Um, well, so you, Scott, you're right. Uh, both Swiss and Italian meringue buttercreams will be whiter, but they won't be 100% white because of the fact that you're using butter. So you can try and find um, like a 
Land of Lakes, like there's certain brands that are are more white. So European style butter that's whiter will also give you a whiter buttercream. Um, and then you can just use like white food coloring as well. So it just kind of depends on on uh, what you're doing, but you can use like a, a gel based white food coloring as well if you're looking for that bright white. Yeah, and then always make sure you whip your butter uh, enough. Uh, by whipping it, not only you make it lighter, but you're going to incorporate air, which will make it whiter. Okay, so so that's very important. Uh, give put enough air in there so it it gets nice and white. Excellent. Thank you. So next question we have from uh, Caitlin. If I wanted to split making a layered cake across two days, what steps or prep would be ideal for day one? Mm -hmm. uh, so you would make day one if you you make your cake. Um, once it's out of the oven and cooled slightly, you want to wrap it really well and put that in the refrigerator right away. Um, use cover it with plastic wrap use the refrigerator as a tool to kind of seal in the freshness of your cake and then um, also on day one you can also make your buttercream um, let's just say you're using an italian ring buttercream you make your buttercream you take it out of your kitchenaid bowl you put it in a container airtight container and you let it just sit at room temperature because you're going to use it the next day on day two is when you pull your cake out you trim trim it at all uh, if you need to. And then if your buttercream is, you're gonna need to take a whisk or a spatula, just kind of gently mix it. If it's a little bit too cold, pop it in the microwave, five seconds at a time, mixing each time, just so it brings back that nice creamy texture, and then you're ready to fill and frost. But it's better to yeah, do it in two days, it's that. less stressful. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right. Um, here is a question. Hi, Chef. My ganache is not as thick for piping, but seems a bit liquidy. And when I refrigerate for thickness, it's not as shiny as it should be. It looks kind of dry. So uh, I'm not sure if she's using our recipe, but what could be one of those issues that it's uh, not as thick enough for piping? What, 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 if, was the, what was the not thick enough? I heard I missed The ganache question. is not thick enough and it's not as shiny. So if it's not thick enough, is your ratio of chocolate compared to heavy cream is not where it should be. You have too much, too much liquid coming from the heavy cream compared to the chocolate. Some people put milk into ganache. Don't ask me why, because it's, it's full of water. It's mainly water. And so it's probably the ratio that is, that is not right. And, and also if a ganache is not shiny, uh, I mean, we saw we saw shiny the, the ganaches in the video that we showed today. If it's not shiny, it's not well emulsified. So that's the that's the reason usually. And usually we like to hit it with a, an immersion blender at the end, just to uh, teach that fat a lesson and to force it to incorporate with the rest of the ingredients. And it's important to note that cold ganache will always be slightly even a well emulsified cold ganache will be slightly duller in texture and like sheen than mm -hmm. if it's like a nice room temperature. Um, at room temperature, it's going to look a little bit more shiny as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. All right. Here's a question uh, with reference to your note on peanut butter or adding peanut butter to a uh, buttercream. Did you say omit butter when using peanut butter in dark chocolate ganache? Uh, same amount in weight as butter? So oh. are you taking out some of the butter by weight and adding peanut oh, butter yes. for flavor? Yes, I did say that. Percentages? You can you can you can omit the the butter and put uh, peanut butter, roasted nut butter at the end because adding you see adding uh, peanut butter on top of butter, now you have four ingredients with with fat. So uh, it's a little too much, right? Too much. So how about you remove the butter and you replace it with roasted peanut butter? That should bring a very nice flavor, you know? Excellent. All right, next question. And we've got lots of questions coming in today. Thanks. Uh, from Arvina, can we stabilize buttercream with unflavored gelatin so it doesn't melt when keeping cake at room temperature? Uh, it shouldn't melt. It should not melt. Uh, uh, buttercream should not melt, but, you know, I worked in 
many very hot countries and uh, sometimes uh, cakes cakes uh, are left out longer than they should adding gelatin uh, I've, I've never, never heard of that no. we have never heard of that so probably not and anyway uh, eating a, eating a, a cake a buttercream cake when it gets so close to room temperature it's like it's it's not very good to eat it's not well, I mean, it should be room temperature, but if your yeah. room temperature is like 85, yes. you know, then then you have to do something to to accommodate your cake. Yes. So I've talked to a few students who have, you know, lived in Barbados or Florida, and they don't know what to do with their wedding cake. So they have it sitting on a little bit of dry ice or on like a couple cold packs. So that cake is staying cold, even though the room itself is a little bit warmer. Um and that's the best. I mean, if your cake is sitting at 72 degrees, um, it should not be melting yes. if the buttercream is made correctly. But, you know, uh, I was thinking about uh, the question adding gelatin. Gelatin would just uh, control the water in the buttercream. Yeah. yeah? But if, you're, if your so cake that. is in a warm environment, the butter is still going to soften and, 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 and not melt, but get, get close to melting. So the answer is no, uh, don't, don't add gelatin to a buttercream. It's a tricky business. It's tricky business. It takes in, in hot weather, yeah. All right, here comes a great question uh, from Sheila. What do you think about the ermine, the rubase frosting uh, for the Waldorf Astoria red velvet cake? So the rubase frosting with the reduced milk, the ermine frosting. Have you heard of this, Chef Alyssa? I have not. Sorry, we're not yeah, cool. It's, it's new. To, it's new to me. Oh. It's new to you too. Okay. Well, we're gonna do some research it's and come to, back. It's new to me. Come back to it. All right, Sheila. Is there, Thanks for the question. The uh, you have the, officially I mean, stumped the chefs. <laughs> it's a flour frosting or a or a boiled milk frosting. Um, it's also called a roux frosting or a boiled milk frosting. I kind of just looked it up since it's a new word to me too. Well, I'll research well, it and for come back. The chef, come Sheila. Back. All right. This is a, the next question is from Chris. Uh, chefs, celebration cakes often come with drama. Can you tell us one of your most um, marked memory while working on or delivering a celebration cake? Um, chef Alyssa, is this, maybe you have a story uh, behind this. I always have stories. I mean, what's the drama? <laughs> like, is it the customer or is it drama the delivery? Is drama, okay. right? I've I've I dropped did you, a cake. Did you drop the cake? I've only dropped a cake once, and it was luckily like the day before. I was literally about to frost it, but it was a very like specific. They wanted like rainbow layers, so I had to go back and make like all these different colored layers. So that was kind of a bit of drama. And I was just telling Chef Jackie, I almost dropped a wedding cake this weekend. Yes. Um, four tiers, icy sidewalk. And um, I took one for the team and I threw out my back and, but the cake is beautiful and delivered. So. And uh, I have a story. I, I helped a, a friend, um, a friend, uh, cake decorator. She asked me if I could deliver this cake. And so I was I just I was just a delivery guy, okay? Uh -huh. And then I had nothing to do with the cake. <laughs> and I was supposed to deliver the cake to uh, the, there's a ship here in Chicago at Navy Pier that uh, it's called Odyssey something. Mm -hmm. They have dinners, they have weddings, and this and that. And I was supposed to deliver it, of course, at a certain time. And my cake decorator was late. And so I got the cake very late in the car and I drove as fast as possible. And to this day, I still remember I arrive at Navy oh, Pier yeah. with the cake in, in the, the back boat. and I see the ship, <laughs> the ship go away. It's like in a movie, you know, but you like, you like, and so I, I, it was awful. <laughs> I waited in the car until the, the ship came like back. Two hours later. Yes, and I brought the cake. Oh, it was just awful. So, but not your fault. No, never, no. never. But uh, uh, never. Talking about uh, talking about uh, dropping a cake. A cake decorator told me once that 
she always has a four layer cake in the freezer sitting there as your emergency yeah, cake yeah. just in case we have icy sidewalks in chicago that happens uh, for about six months in the year <laughs> and uh and then you you if you drop the cake you can rush back and then uh build another Make it one happen. A tip never deliver a cake with a significant other <laughs> that is the key Why? to my happy marriage is i stopped having my husband deliver cakes with me isn't he a better driver no mm. just carrying wise we just okay. end up yelling so that's the drama I, I hear you guys could go on forever with stories this is fun yes yeah many many All stories right. I'm just, that's the moving nice. on to the next question i think this has been answered this is from uh catherine how do you make a hard uh, grenache coating i think she means ganache coating and I think this is what we reviewed with using the, the chocolate yeah, glaze. Yeah, we talked about this cream uh, earlier. And the chocolate. Yes. Yep. So that's that's the answer, Catherine, using the, uh, the chocolate gla glaze, which eliminates the butter. And it's just chocolate and a proportion of cream so that it's crunchy when it dries yes. and cools. Yep. All right, Kate, uh, another question from Kate. Uh, can you use non-pasteurized whites, which have been frozen? And yes, you can. We've yes. uh, reviewed yes, that, can. making sure that you save your whites or your egg yolks from whatever preparations you're making, and then you can use them both in the different uh, applications. So for sure, being able to use no egg whites. Yep. Um, from Janelle, my, my Italian meringue buttercream frosting isn't smooth in the final coat. This is after it was frozen and defrosted in the refrigerator. We're gonna run the spatula over the frosting. There are large pockets of air. Any tips to make it smoother? Yes. So um, that can happen when buttercream has been made and then stored, whether it's in the refrigerator, even at room temperature, it can develop those air pockets. Um, so what you wanna do is make sure that it's at room temperature. Um, so pop it in the microwave five seconds at a time, um, just to make sure that it's nice and smooth with your spatula. And then to get rid of those air pockets, you can just kind of gently start mixing it with your spatula, or you can put it on the mixer with a paddle attachment on a very low speed, and that's just gonna work out those air bubbles. But it has to be very soft and, and a nice smooth consistency. If you start mixing with a paddle and your buttercream's cold, it's gonna separate. Yeah, it's, so it's a question of uh, fat crystallization. Uh, since you, we're talking about a frosting that was sitting in the fridge overnight and also air pockets. So those two have to be addressed uh, the, the buttercream has to be uh, brought to room temperature and then slowly mixed so so it will uh, it will get smooth again. Uh, so moving on, uh, next question from uh, Helena again. What are the signs that I've deflated my egg whites when making buttercream? Other than the the visual sign that it's not holding stiff peaks, what other type of signs might there be, chefs? It it turns yellowish and um and it's not light at all and also it will taste eggier okay buttery. yeah more buttery more buttery yeah the the, the buttercream will be buttery but the, the 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 egg white will taste very eggy okay so it's very it's very important to pour the hot syrup if you if you make the italian meringue pour the hot syrup right after it was cooked on the on the egg white and then just whip it just uh, until it, it makes a nice meringue and then go and go and add the butter okay yeah, most of yeah most of the time if a buttercream is if the meringue starts to deflate it's because the temperature wasn't monitored correctly so maybe you added the butter and it was too warm like the meringue was too warm so the butter got added and you have to mix it a little bit longer because it looks soupy and um, that's going to deflate your egg whites so adding the butter too soon or the opposite if you add your butter and it's cold and then you have to start warming up your buttercream and going back and forth in the microwave and then mixing that can also um, deflate your buttercream yes. yep okay so one of the good thing about you're watching this live event and you're hear, hearing a lot of tips and techniques, you're not seeing the complete recipes nor the complete videos, the course itself, of course, will have all the videos and recipes, but it also has a lot of uh, tips and techniques for every recipe um, and troubleshooting for each one. So all these notes that are being talked about and 
these are actually chronicalized within the course. So yes. let's move on to uh, the next question. This is from Sherry. Uh, for ganaches, what is the ratio of cream to chocolate for dark milk or white chocolates? I know this isn't a recipe, but there must be a ratio off the top of your head. Uh -huh. What are you using it for, right? What are you using it for? That's not only, that, it's a loaded question. Uh, what are you using this ganache for? Are you using it for a filling or are you using it for truffles? If you're using it for truffles, the ganache has to be able to hold its shape, okay? So you, you have the ratio of heavy cream and chocolate. Then you have the amount of fat in your chocolate, right? This is a chocolate that has about 35% fat, okay? Uh, other chocolates that are... Uh, that are uh, uh, not as, as quality chocolate, they, they might have different kind of fat or lower amount of fat and more sugar. So the more fat and the more solids, also cocoa solids in the chocolate, the sturdier the ganache, and, and usually you don't have to put that much. So there's, there is no, there's no uh, ratio we can give. I mean, you can start with equal parts. Um. For dark chocolate, yes. Usually for milk and white, because it has a, a lower fat content and solid content, you would start two to one. Yes. Two parts chocolate, one part cream. Yeah. Um, and then you go from there. Yeah, but that's just a very, very broad uh, uh, ratio. And then after that, like, like I said, uh, all depends what you use it for and also uh, how much fat and solids you have in your chocolate. And okay. never wing it. Never ever wing it, Chef Never. Scott. Okay. Not for ganache. Well, you, you no tell me well. So thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here's a question uh, from Adam. This is with regards to uh, what are three pieces of advice you would give to a person who wanted to start a cake decorating business? Uh, three pieces of advice. Well, I know that you have a cake okay. decorating business, Chef Alyssa. What uh, What are some advice that you, you might do share? Three. I do three. Oh my gosh. You do three, I do you three. You start. I'm like, I gotta really I think start, about this. Get get a lawyer <laughs> because because uh, uh, you'll you'll do a, a wedding cake for two thousand dollars and uh, and uh, usually you 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 ask to be paid uh, oh, 15, you should be paid before you fifteen <laughs> days fifteen days before the wedding. But if you're too nice, then maybe the bride and groom are gonna disappear in Hawaii and spend all the money. And then, and then you have to go chase after them. So that's first advice. Second advice, before you start a cake decorating shop, buy a nice tool kit, like from, from a hardware store, because you're gonna be spending a lot of time fixing small, small uh, machines or, or like tools. Uh, I, I, I saw that, um, that this is very useful. And the third one, what would be the third one? Uh, I said it before, have a, a wedding cake sitting in the freezer uh -huh. at all time and, uh, and, and make sure uh, your delivery driver is the person who are. Uh, oh no, not, not that, forget about that one. I'm gonna give you another one. Is uh, in the back of your car, you need to have a small, now it's like a, a small uh, kit. Yeah. No, that's my tip, you cannot take my tip. A small tool kit, but not a pastry tool kit with uh, spatulas and piping bags and some extra buttercream and all this because in case you drop the cake or parts of the cake, you should be able to fix it right there on the spot. Because sometimes the wedding is like one hour away from your bakery and there's no way you can drive back and get all this stuff and, and make it again at the wedding. Okay, now you go okay. for three. Three. Um, first, I would say to um, know your limits when it comes to cake decorating. Do not say yes to something you don't feel comfortable doing. That is key. So know your limits on like, if someone asks you to do a figure, you're like, I think I can, <laughs> you shouldn't, okay? Until you've practiced. If you have time to practice and you're willing to put in that time, um, then okay. But don't say yes to something you don't feel comfortable doing because it usually ends up um, bad. Number two, um, streamline your recipes. So know how much like your vanilla cake. You, so make sure you have the right 
amount that goes into a six inch cake, the right amount of batter that goes into an eight inch cake, 10 inch cake, um, how many fillings you like, the, how much filling you're going to use for each uh, layer. Um, that's super important so that you're not wasting ingredients. Um, and my third one is streamline your menu. Don't say yes to everything. So have some really core um, ingredients and recipes that you're going to use, flavor profiles, and kind of stick with that. You can always do a, a rotation of one or two um, specialty fillings um, per the season. But the more recipes you make, the more waste you have. You're never going to use it all. So those you're are my done? three. Yeah. I have another one. Oh, my gosh. I know. So if somebody wants a, a, a cake uh, and, and it's got to have a certain color, let's say this red color, right? What, what I recommend is that you go to a hardware store and you buy, um, a, how do you call those, uh, paint, paint sweat, swashes? Sure. Palette. Palette. You don't know what it's called. I'm just going to and, say uh, And you... You need to agree with the customer on the, not only the color, but then there's a number usually, and you put this in a contract because yeah. because you know what's going to happen. They're going to want this red, and then you're going to get a completely different red, and and they're going to say, "I'm not paying you. Sorry, you it's the wrong it's the wrong red." Okay. You have some bad customers. So. No, 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 <laughs> never. That sounds like right, these are from experience. Get a lawyer. <laughs> All right, here's an easy question from Jan. What goes best with sweet cream, also known as heavy cream? Uh, my answer is mm. everything. Um, but what might no, you, you guys answer? answer? That was my answer, That's Scott. That's my answer. I said, what doesn't go well with sweet cream? Everything goes well with sweet cream. Yeah. Really, it's it's uh, a... <clears throat> We, we, we say it's a round flavor when something is nice and smooth and, and sweet because heavy cream is not that acidic like compared to yogurt like or sour buttermilk cream, or, yeah. buttermilk. So pretty much everything goes well with sweet cream. That's my answer. It's mine too. All right, a few more questions here in the queue. Um, one is a Colette and it's just a comment. Hey chefs, thanks so much for this presentation on fillings and frostings. Our pleasure. This is a uh, part three of a six part series. Uh, we will be back on uh, February 16th uh, for fondant, uh, the elusive fondant. So another question from Arvena. It's uh, hello, Chef Jackie, Chef Alyssa, and Chef Scott. My question is, after I start whipping uh, Italian meringue um, using for French buttercream, the texture is not any more shiny and smooth, but looks like dry and grainy. Am I whipping too long or I, cold, I would no? say it got cold. Yeah. It got cold. All the butter was not, probably the butter was not soft enough. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> maybe it's a combination. The butter was not soft enough, or let's say it was soft, but your kitchen is super cold. We get a lot of those problems during the winter. Um, not you, you're in Hawaii, Chef Scott. So, uh, but for the rest of the world, uh, the kitchens are cold. And let's say you have a butter that is kind of too cold. And then the egg white that you whip, you let it whip also, and it's a little too cold. Now it's not warm anymore. Yeah. And you, you mix those two together, and it's going to look kind of like grainy-ish and not so shiny. That's usually a sign of um, a buttercream that is too cold. So try throwing in the microwave for five seconds at a time, and each time kind of mixing it. And, and if it's still grainy, back in the microwave five seconds until it comes together and is smooth. Sounds like it's cold. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, here's a question about plant-based butter. Uh, do you have any recommendations for how to use plant-based butter in place of regular butter? And this is from Sarah Emma. And I think we answered this in terms of yes. keeping in mind the fat content. High enough fat yes. content, correct? And yeah, yeah. Uh, limited salt. One, uh, so oh. either unsalted. Yeah. All right, Always here unsalted. is uh, from Always Sheila. Unsalted, yeah. Question from Sheila. Do you like a KitchenAid copper mixing bowl for beating egg whites? Do no. I like which one? No, uh, uh, using the copper bowl, uh, KitchenAid has it. There is, there, it's uh, it's uh, a gimmick, pretty much. Uh, you don't need to whip egg white in copper. Uh, they, they'll, they'll, maybe they'll whip better, but, but you don't need this tool in your house. If you have it, it's great. great. Yeah. 
fine. Don't but uh, we we don't use this in the in the food industry. Uh, I've been in the industry long enough where we would do everything with copper, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, later on it switched to stainless steel. But uh, you can use it; it whips really well. But you don't have to. It's not it's not something that is needed. Okay. And okay, thank you. You always need to uh, make sure the the copper uh, is um, if it's lined with copper on the inside, you need to uh, clean it with uh, vinegar and salt first, so the oxidation goes away. And then you need to rinse it with water. Then you can put food in there. Okay. No, that's that's the one thing I learned today. I've never heard that you needed to rinse it with vinegar and salt. Interesting. See, you're going to learn something every day if you're not careful. You too, chef. Okay, salted or unsalted butter for buttercream from uh, Maury. And I think we have uh, unsalted. noted unsalted. Unsalted. I have a story. No. Yes, I do. I, I was working in a bakery and... Uh, I know the story. Can I finish it? <laughs> the, the owner was had two types of butter in the fridge and i said to him don't that's a bad idea somebody's gonna use the wrong butter for the wrong job and sure enough somebody used 80 pounds of salted butter to make a buttercream so we, we had 80 pounds of salty, bu salty buttercream and we tried to salvage this buttercream we put chocolate in there we put uh zest citrus zest God knows what, and the more more things we were adding to it, the worse it gets, and then we just threw it in, in the garbage. Sorry. Uh, but uh, unsalted butter. Uh, you can add a pinch of salt, but you have to, you know what I mean? Like, you have to control it. Yes, there's, there's... yeah. We control freaks. So unsalted yeah. butter, if you want to add salt, you put it in there, but don't don't have two types of butter in your kitchen. Only bad things will happen. All right. Thanks for your words of wisdom, chefs. A um, couple more questions here. Uh, this is from Tammy, and I think we kind of have answered this. Do we need to age egg whites for the buttercreams? Do we need to what? No, Sorry? you don't need to age the egg whites for no, the buttercreams. You don't need to age, age them. No. no. You can okay. use aged egg whites if you have them, but you don't have to take that extra step. Yes. Okay. Um, and last question here is from Diana. Uh, can inverted sugar be used to replace powdered sugar to make the buttercream? It's kind of a trick question because we're not using powdered sugar to make the buttercream. We're using the powdered sugar uh, for the frosting, the cream cheese frostings and yeah. such. So inverted sugar to replace no. regular sugar. She, 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 in inverted sugar... Uh, inverted sugar is really a, a product that has been uh, inverted and reduced. And inverted sugar is actually sweeter than sugar. Okay, some and of huh? Some of it. Some of it. And uh, if we're talking about glucose, that's also an inverted sugar. But I, I think Diana is talking about something, something like what we use in the industry called trimoline. Uh, oh. we, we we don't we don't do that. It's just too sweet. Okay, uh, so the answer, Diana, is no. Sometimes in commercially, uh, in American bakeries, in, in commercial bakeries, they'll, they'll use some sort of like inverted type sugar. Yes. Um, but we don't use that for Swiss or Italian meringue buttercreams. We use this in sponges. It emulsifies the fat, but not in buttercreams, you know. And Chef Scott, I want to show you something. I just got something in the mail here. Because uh, you know, as yeah. pastry chefs, we are control freaks, right? And uh, I, yes, I get a I lot of that. those questions from our students. Uh, a lot of, a lot of people have problems with the oven, right? Because uh, the oven says it's measure, it's it's a three fifty, but uh, God knows what's happening in this oven. And so, Thermoworks made this. Uh, it's called a square dot. It's a uh, a thermometer that has two probes. So this probe stays in the oven, and this probes. If you mm -hmm. if you're cooking meat, you can put it in the meat. Otherwise, you don't have to use it. Can just pop it out. If you just 
if right. you just want this. And this sits outside of the oven. And the great thing about this, it's it will read an, a 15 minute average temperature of what's going on in your oven. It's really cool. Nice. Uh, for us pastry geeks, this is just wonderful. And then you will see actually the fluctuation of your oven. It will it might go from 360 to 340 and then back to 350 and so on. So this is a, a great tool that I was very happy to uh, to get today in the mail. Uh, that should help us uh, understand more what's going on in the oven because everybody is a different oven. Uh, people have convection ovens uh, or a conventional oven or, electric, or gas, yeah. Yeah, gas, electric, uh, whatnot. And, and some are conventional that you can turn into um, uh, convection. The sky's the limit. So this, this little yep. guy right here, uh, is going to give us more uh, information on what's going on in this oven, okay? Well, I'm glad you brought that up and I'm glad you ordered one uh, because that's probably 50% of our questions are asking about our oven temperature. <laughs> yes. And yeah, that's why. That's are why very I'm, specific uh, very about excited. 350 and 360. Yep. Awesome. Well, Chef uh, Jackie Pfeiffer and Chef Alyssa Wallers, I really appreciate your time today for part three and everything, frostings, buttercreams, and fillings. Uh, and moving on to part four in a few weeks, February 16th. Um, we'll see everyone back there and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.